everybody. Welcome to Crow. Thank you so much for joining us today on our Wildlife Wednesday. We are here today to talk about owls, specifically of Southwest Florida, but owls in general. If you have questions, feel free to leave them in the comments section. We will answer them after the program ends. And if you like what you hear today, please feel free to hit the donate button at any time during the program or after. Um, we're going to go ahead and get started. I do have here with me today Nina, our great horned owl. We will touch more on her story as we get going. But like I said, if you have questions, feel free to ask. We love sharing what we know. My name is Brianna. I am our rehab manager here. I've been here since January of 2015. Uh, I am a certified wildlife rehabber, and my background is actually in chemistry. So I don't have a wildlife background. I do have experience with large exotics and domestic surgical practice, but here I am happy five years later. And Mina is one of the animals that I have trained from the beginning of her time here at Crow. So owls are what's classified as a bird of prey, or what we call a raptor. There are a couple key characteristics that make a bird of prey a bird of prey. One of those being their talons, you can see up here. They also have a very curved, sharp beak used for tearing apart their food. And a lot of times people ask, well, what about perfect eyesight? You know, they hear bald eagles have perfect vision and all this other stuff. But honestly, from species to species, they have a wide variety of eyesight ability. So there is no such thing as perfect, but what works for each individual animal varies from species to species. So that is not one of the classifications. So the talon and the beak, those are the two most important. And owls do fall under that category because they do use their talons and their beak for hunting purposes. Now in the world, there's over 200 different species of owls, and that's a huge number. We really only think about the owls we see in our backyard, so maybe three, four, five species if we really know what we're looking for. In North America, we have about 20 native species here, and here in Southwest Florida, we actually have five native to our area. Now owls are not considered to be a migratory bird. In general, there are a couple that have started to migrate from the way far north, south a little bit, one of those being the snowy owls if you're visiting from up north, um, but typically they do stay in the same year or the same area year round. Now great horns specifically are adapt to all different climates. They do go all the way up north into Canada. They are all the way down here in southwest Florida, so they can adapt to a wide variety of climates. Now they are also typically considered a monogamous bird. So owls will typically stay with the same mate um, throughout nesting season. Most owls will come back to the mate from uh, previous years. And there are certain circumstances, uh, barn owls for example, if their mate passes away, the other one will slowly go into a depression and potentially follow suit because they are so monogamous together and they have such a close bond. So it is a beautiful thing about owls, but a lot of other species will continue on, find a new mate and go on with life. These are the five species that we have here in Southwest Florida. As you can see, they do have a lot of similarities and it's kind of hard to tell in general what size they are in comparison. So we obviously have the great horned owl down here. Above that we have the barn owl, which excitingly enough for us on Sanibel, we do have several active nests. My favorite being right across the street at the Sanibel School. We have every single year for the past couple years been able to rescue some of the babies that have fallen from the nest prematurely and put them right back up there. In the center, we have eastern screech owls. Now, there are also western screech owls for the western part of the country, but these eastern screech owls are small little fuzzballs and are commonly confused for baby owls. We get lots of calls about baby owls that need assistance, but it turns out they are just small adult owls. Here on Sanibel, we actually have caution low-flying owl signs to let people know that there are screech owls that are hunting during dawn and dusk. They do enjoy using people's headlamps on bikes or their car lights when they're driving at those times to find insects and in turn might bounce off a bicyclist or the side of your car. So if you see a small owl on the side of the road, don't be afraid to see if it's doing okay. Down here we also have one of the most common owls, the barred owl. They have a beautiful who cooks for you type call that they make. They are well known across the United States. They are one of the bigger owls that we have here as well. And above that, one of our favorites, the burrowing owls. Now, burrowing owls have a huge population here in Cape Coral and Marco Island. There's not very many of them in Fort Myers. So they are one of our diurnal species. Most owls are classified as nocturnal. They do their hunting, their feasting, their baby raising, all that great stuff at night. 
but burrowing owls down here are seen out during the day hunting, flying, doing whatever they want, although they can also be active at night. Now looking at these photos, you can tell they all have a lot in common. Their beaks, their massive eyes, their circular facial discs, their feet, but the one thing, the most important thing that they all have in common is their coloration or their ability to camouflage, and that allows them to survive even in some of the toughest of times. So before we get a little bit more onto that, um, we have a good size comparison photo for you here. It was done by one of our falconer friends, Amy. She's amazing. Um, the photo was not taken side by side because, for a good reason, you know, uh, this is Mina right here. She may have just leaned right over and uh, swallowed that little screech owl whole if she had the chance. So this is Mina. You can tell because she is missing a lot of her right wing. So you can't actually see that portion missing right here. It looks like she's wearing pants. Um, and the little screech owl is an adult screech owl. So this is a great side-by-side -side comparison of exactly what you're looking at when you see Florida's largest and smallest owls. Now, great horned owls are not the tallest owl species in the United States. That sits with the great gray owls, but great horns are one of the heaviest owls. Them and snowy owls are massive. They've got huge amounts of muscle and they are very, very good predators. Now you can see here that this does almost look like mom and baby. Their coloration is so similar that people oftentimes confuse the adult owls for babies just based on their size. But as you can see, based on their coloration, they very well could be the same species, but we know that they're not. So that leads into the camouflage portion of how important it is for them to be able to survive. Now here we have an Eastern Screech Owl. Now, hopefully you can see this uh, wherever you're watching from, but the main pur uh, pur uh, purpose of this is to be able to see that this Screech Owl is nested in a cavity. So you can see the body outlined right here. So we'll start with the talons just right here. The body comes up around, here's the tuft, each tuft comes back around this side and you actually have the two eyes right here. Now it's very hard to see them because they blend in with their surroundings. So the trees that they live in, the canopies they live under, they are surviving there because of camouflage purposes. So when you go out and you're looking for wildlife, it is hard to find owls because they blend in so easily. Most of the time, if you do come across them, it's because you see them flying, you hear them calling, or you catch sight of their eyes while their eyes are open. Now, owl eyes can range in a wide variety of colors from grays and browns to yellows and oranges as well. So if you catch a glimpse of those bright yellow eyes like Mina has, it's very easy to tell where they are. If you have gray eyes like this screech owl here blending into a gray background with gray and white feathers, it is very difficult to see. So it brings us to our first adaptation for owls. Now their feet are absolutely incredible. So owls have typically two toes that face backwards and two that face forward. One of their toes that sits along the outside of each one has a flexible joint and allows that toe to rotate so it can face either forwards or backwards to perch on a wide variety of surfaces and hunt a wide variety of prey. Now on the bottom of the foot, you'll see this beautiful texture. It's almost like Velcro. And what it does is one, it protects the feet from any of the prey that fights back if they're being caught, but it also allows them to get a great grip on the food that they're hunting because of that extra Velcro-like claw uh, resistance there. So, with that, it allows them to hunt safely, appropriately, and get a really, really, really nice uh, quick kill there. So as you can see here, we've got two toes facing forward and two that face backwards. And over there, you'll see there's one backwards and three kind of in the forward position there. Now, out in the wild, they naturally file their talons down, just like we cut our nails, we trim our dog's toenails. It's the exact same things with birds in captivity. We have to make sure that their toes or their talons they don't grow out too far because like in our dogs and our cat nails, they have a quick. So in captivity, we have to be very careful that Mina's talons don't get too long. So each month she goes to spa day where we clip a tiny bit off her talons. We make sure they're the appropriate length because if we don't, those talons can actually grow out around and back up into the bottom of the foot, which causes a massive amount of issues. So we have to be very careful. In the wild, they naturally file those down by climbing trees, um, by hunting their prey items, by even running to catch prey sometimes. So they do a very good job of that out in the wild. In captivity, we have to be very, very cautious. Now, great horned owls are very strong birds. Their gripping pressure is up to 500 pounds per square inch of pressure. So that's about equal to the bite force of an adult German shepherd in a very small animal. So that's pretty impressive. And that's actually what makes them such incredible predators. 
Now, their feet are so strong, it allows them to do a whole bunch of different movements with them. The first being owl yoga, very important as you can see here. As owls wake up and get ready for their nighttime routine, they go through a ritual of preening, of cleaning, of putting all their feathers in place, of stretching their wings, stretching their legs, making sure they're in tip-top condition for hunting. In order to do that, they have to stretch. It's kind of like how we wake up in the morning, maybe your muscles don't feel so good from the day before, you kind of stretch and decide, you know, do I want to get out of bed today or not kind of thing. Well, they don't have a choice because they have to hunt for their food. They have to fly and accurately hunt to provide for their babies, for their partner, and um, whatnot. So they have to be able to be in good shape here. Now you'll see that this owl here has the two toes facing forward and two backwards, as opposed to this one that has three that kind of wrap around. So it shows you a wide variety that they can perch on. Now Mina, because of her wing loss, she has some balance issues. She's been getting stronger every single day for the past couple years. But for her, she doesn't have the ability to balance like this. So what she does is she can put one foot on her perch and she'll rest the other one in knuckle formation and just kind of rest it on top of the perch. So she can't quite do this. In order to do this, she will lean against me or against an enclosure wall um, and she will slowly do one wing and then the other and then she will alternate legs as well. It takes about 15 minutes or so, but she does get a good stretch in every single day. All right, so those feathers. Now we know that they're good for camouflage purpose, but there's a lot more to owl feathers than just that. Now owls have these beautifully serrated primary feathers. So what most people don't realize is that owls have silent flight, and that's because of how their feathers have developed. So these beautiful serrations, they are visible to the naked eye. So if you come across an owl feather, you will see those serrations on those primaries. And those actually help to diminish the sounds of turbulence as they're flying through the air. They also have extremely soft body feathers and secondary feathers, which also muffles the sounds that they make when they're flying. This allows them to be incredible predators, although Mina can't be a predator anymore since she's missing her wing. She actually sounds like a baby elephant when she's tromping through the clinic, running around and doing her thing. So it is pretty incredible that they have this ability because without it, they wouldn't be nearly as good predators. Now feathers are also used to depict how they're feeling. Now this is a young great horned owl, a fledgling juvenile. You can tell because of the head, it still has all the baby feathers around the face. It does not have the adult feathers or the tufts, which are known as plumicorns. Now this owl is telling you to back off. This is an aggressive stance. If you come across babies on the ground, they are not always orphaned. A lot of times they jump from the nest and they take about five to seven days or so before they're flighted to the point of being able to evade predators. This is called the fledgling period, and this is completely normal for all bird species. During that time, they will be on the ground for several days, learning how to fly, taking short flights, hopping around, even climbing trees, and most people assume that they've been orphaned, but they haven't. Their parents do continue to care for them while they're on the ground, as was the case with this baby. Now this baby is making itself look as big as possible. If this were in person, those feathers would be shaking, the beak would be clacking very loud, telling you all the perfect signs to back off. And what most people also don't realize about great horned owls is they are very fast runners. They do not have to fly to catch their prey. They can successfully hunt by running. So if you come up on a great horned owl, you, you really don't want to get too close. You know, it's great to get in that photo and everything, but we should really leave wildlife alone and let nature take its course. So the parents are still in the area. They are still feeding this baby, and this baby is telling that person to back off. Give it space. Leave it alone. And knowing how strong those talons are, I would definitely agree it's best to leave it alone. Now, if you are concerned about anything, you know, out of the ordinary, blood, broken wings, broken legs, anything like that, call your local rehab center before you take matters into your own hands. So because Mina, unfortunately, has some balance issues, it also means that she's prone to bad feather days. So we get bad hair days. Unfortunately, with her balance, she sometimes has bad feather days because she can't lean to all the appropriate sides to put her feathers back in order appropriately. So we do sometimes have to help her out. It does look really cute, but as we know, when our hair gets messed up, it really can be very uncomfortable. So she is okay with us taking a brush or a comb, brushing out her feathers into the appropriate condition, and then leaving her alone, which she greatly appreciates. But it's very important to keep her feathers in tip-top condition as well, even though she's in rehab. So what do they eat? Well, most people think that owls only eat rodents, but that's not necessarily the case. Great horned owls eat anything they can put their talons into. So they can take medium to large raccoons from down here, um, 
they take on barred owls. They even take on great horned owls of you know their own species. Uh, one of the most famous that we have down here is they are constantly going after the eagles that we have. So they do not care what type of predator it is. They don't care what type of prey it is. All they care about is feeding themselves, feeding their babies, and getting more food. So as you can see here, they have a lot of food options down here in Southwest Florida. They eat reptiles, insects, small mammals, medium mammals, um, even various types of fish. Mina's favorite fish to date uh, is actually red grouper. It was illegally seized by SWC off a boat uh, last year. Mina got the taste of it and she absolutely loved it. She was begging for more. So she actually hasn't had it since, which is very disappointing. Um, also very good because we should not be getting that into the clinic, but she did love it. So she gets a wide variety of food here at the clinic to kind of mimic what she would eat in the wild. So she doesn't get the same thing day after day. She gets a wide variety of different types of rodents and quail and fish and all sorts of different things to keep her nice and healthy. But the important thing to remember is that down here in South Florida, all of our animals are smaller than up north. So if our great horned owls down here can pick up eight pound raccoons or so, the ones up north can pick up 10 to 12 pound raccoons, which also means if you have outdoor cats or dogs that you let out late at night and they're very small, it is good to be on the cautious side. So this is an owl pellet. Um, in fifth grade, I dissected an owl pellet. I put back together the skeleton of a bull and I fell in love with science, even though I didn't seem like it. Um, turns out I work with these every single day now and they are so important for a wide variety of reasons. Firstly, they're important for ornithologists or bird scientists to figure out what are these owls eating as we're going through periods of deforestation and building and as our communities are growing, how is that impacting wildlife? What are they eating now? Here in the clinic, we need to make sure all of our animals that come through as patients and ambassadors are healthy enough to do this. So, Owls have a two-chambered stomach. In the first chamber, it allows all the soft tissues and the muscles and the good stuff to pass through and get spread to where it's needed in the body. And it wads up all the undigestible material. So that is the fur, the teeth, the tail, the bones, all that yucky stuff. And after each meal, they do produce a pellet. They regurgitate that pellet to make room for more food. Now, this is really important in our hospital because as we get baby owls and baby raptors, they don't have the ability to do this right away. So we need to work them up to eating that whole prey with the fur on and everything like that. Or we can move too quickly and unfortunately cause some type of impaction. So we have to be very cautious. We have to know how hydrated our animals are, know how healthy they are, and know any type of background um, that might associate with having trouble producing a cast. Now these come in all shapes and sizes. If Mina eats just a couple nights for dinner one day, her cast might be a little bit larger than a quarter. Um, if she eats a large rat one day, her cast might be a lot larger, about this size. I don't know if you can see that. Um, but the color varies, the size varies, the consistency varies based on different species. So it's not just owls that do this. Um, eagles do it, hawks do it, songbirds do it, corvid species like blue jays and crows do it. It is seen all across bird species, so it is really important to know what you are looking for and the significance of it. So here we have a good comparison uh, based on different species. A lot of people, you know, ask, well, what if I'm looking for these in the wild? Is it a good way to figure out, you know, where a nest is? And absolutely, but a lot of times people don't realize what they're looking at because it looks like a lot of dirt or poop and nobody really wants to inspect further. But when we go out and we look for some type of nest, whether it's a hawk nest or an owl nest or anything like that, we always look for piles of pellets. That is one sure way to tell exactly the location of the nest and if we are successful or not. So how do owls hear? This is one of my favorite things about them. So most people think that their ears are actually the tufts on top of their head. That is not true. Surprisingly, those are just tufts. They are just plumicorns. They are just feathers used for camouflage purposes and depicting how they are feeling. So their ears are actually located right behind their eyes on either side of their head, and they are just massive holes in the side of their head. So their ears are really important, obviously, but they use their ears in combination with their facial discs to figure out where their prey is, is hiding. So owl ears are set slightly asymmetrical on the head. So one is a little bit higher than the other, and they use that to hone in on different frequencies above and below the horizon. The facial disc will put all that together, and using all of those wavelengths and all the information that their facial disc puts together, they can accurately hunt their prey items off in the distance without seeing them, which makes them an even bigger predator. So they can accurately hunt just by hearing alone, which is incredible, and that also means with one eye, they can be released. They don't necessarily need to have 
both eyes to hunt because of some of their other adaptations, whereas hawks and eagles cannot be released if they have just one eye. And what about their eyes? So we always hear that they have big, majestic, beautiful eyes, and yes, that is the case. Now, owls with their forward-facing eyes have a great range of binocular vision, uh, but as they've evolved, so have their eyes. So their eyes are actually more of a tube shape than a sphere shape. So unlike us, they can't rotate their eyes in the socket, so they do have to turn the head. They can turn their head about 270 degrees, so not the full 360, um, but that's how they are able to see all around them. And they can't pretty much turn their head upside down. It's a very funny thing if I've ever come across her doing that. Um, she looks very confused when it happens. Um, but due to this, they've got a couple, they have twice as many vertebrae in their neck, which allows them to actually do all of that turning. So their eyes are pretty incredible. You know, with a nocturnal bird, I always get the question, you know, how is it okay she's awake during the day? And it's because her eyes have evolved the same way as ours. The pupils dilate and constrict to let different amounts of light in, so it is safe for her eyes. But owls have actually adapted to survive and hunt at night because that's when their predators are sleeping, that's when their prey is awake. They have just evolved that way. Their eyes are okay to take in the nighttime setting. They're also okay to take in the daytime setting. Now, their eyes have an increased number of rods, so they're much more sensitive to light, which allows them to see better in all that darkness at night. They do have a decreased number of cones, though, so they see a lot less color than we do, and some are actually thought to just see in some type of monochrome. So she is not very good when it comes to target training based on color because she has no idea what color I'm showing her. So as you can see up here um, in both photos, there is this beautiful membrane that you can kind of see here. So that is the third eyelid. So owls have three eyelids. They have one that comes from the top down for blinking, one from the bottom up for sleeping, just like us, and then they have this third eyelid. It's called the nictating membrane, and that is used for cleaning the eye. So that keeps the eye nice and moist. It helps keep it nice and hydrated. It helps protect it from dirt and grime that might get in there. So whenever we have owls that come in that have been hit by a car, or even birds in general that have been affected by red tide or rat poison, a lot of the times they lose that ability to blink. So without that ability, they can end up with corneal ulcers or other eye lesions. So we have to be very cautious and provide the appropriate medical care when that eyelid has been affected. As you can see, they can blink both eyes at the same time, or they can blink one than the other. They don't have to blink at the same time like humans do. So a lot of times when Nina's getting really sleepy, she'll blink one eye and then the other one, and then it gets slower and slower until eventually both eyes are completely closed and she's facing a wall. So that is her happy place to sleep. Now on either side of the beak, they do have some beautiful little feeling whiskers, and those are used for feeling purposes. So whenever I go to feed her, if she's being hand fed that day, she can use those little whiskers to feel around on my fingers to feel where the food is and appropriately pick up the food instead of my fingers, which I greatly appreciate. So what's an owl's biggest predator? Unfortunately, it's humans, even though we don't mean for it to be. Now they come in for a lot of different reasons. As you can see, she's very interested in this slide. Um, she feels very strongly about this as well because she did come in for a reason. So one of the big reasons is we have uh, trees coming down. So not necessarily deforestation, but just regular garden work. You know, you have that tree that's dead and old and it's got a huge hole in it. Nobody likes how it looks in their yard, but it turns out that's where a lot of screech owls nest. It's where uh, woodpeckers nest. There's a lot of animals that use those dead tree holes to build their nesting ability. So um, whenever that happens, a lot of times we get babies that fall from the nest. You know, an immediate call to us and we can tell you exactly how to put them back up, make a fake nest, use a uh, owl box or anything like that so that we can get those babies back with the parents. That is the first option always. You know, we do as good of a job as we can here, but we honestly, you know, we do what we can without going above and beyond like the parents do. They teach them how to fly, they teach them how to hunt, they teach them how to do all the grooming and preening routines, they teach them about calling to each other and you know all those biological functions that they need. So if we can give them back to the parents, they serve a much better chance of survival because just because they leave Crow Clinic and they've grown up and they're eating our food, it doesn't necessarily mean it's a success. It is successful if they know how to hunt, once they learn how to hunt, once they put all of that into action and continually survive for the next year or so. We also see lots of birds that get hit by car that come in. Um, hit by car is not necessarily a means to an end, okay? You know, we have an amazing surgical suite we can place. 
IM pins, so external fixators and everything, in order to heal the bones and bring them back to full play capacity. Um, so it's not the worst thing, but the worst thing is having an animal get hit by a car and then left there. So if that animal is immediately stunned, it will come back to, it might stumble out into the street trying to get away from traffic, but not know which way it's going, and unfortunately be hit by another car or taken by another predator. So if there's been an animal hit by a car, don't be afraid to hop out, stop tra traffic if you have to, um, pick that animal up and get it out of harm's way. That is definitely the first step to healing. We've also seen um, some electrocution cases down here. Unfortunately for a lot of our animals, once a bird has been electrocuted, there's not a whole lot we can do. They are so small in comparison to how big these transformers are, how big the power lines are. Um, we can provide some crucial care for them, but unfortunately it doesn't always go well. So we have to be more proactive rather than reactive to that situation. If you see anything out of the ordinary, let your local electric company know. Um, down here, they're pretty great. They'll be out within 20 to 30 minutes to help us if we have animals entangled in the power lines or whatnot. They've also been really great about helping us uh, to use their bucket trucks to get our baby raptors back up into fake nests, which can range between 40 and 80 feet tall. Um, down here, we also see a lot of predator attacks. Um, when our babies fall to the ground and they're not flighted yet, we have seen a high rise in cat attacks, unfortunately. But predator attack can also mean dog attacks. It can also mean eagles fighting eagles, eagles fighting owls, owls fighting osprey. Predators come in all shapes and sizes down here, especially right now during baby season. All these parents are trying to keep their babies safe and they will do whatever is necessary to do that. One of the worst things that we see down here is rat poison, unfortunately. So rat poison, if you're not familiar, um, is put out for rats or rodents. And the idea is that that rodent eats the poison and then runs away and dies somewhere else. So it's not on your property, you don't have to deal with the body, um, but you are exterminating those populations. Unfortunately for our wildlife, they see that as an easy meal. They see that as a sick animal, it's easy to catch, easy to feed, easy to teach your kids how to catch and feed as well. So what we see is a lot of young birds that are being affected by rat poison. So as the rodents eat the poison, they do pass away very slowly. It is a painful process for them. And then the same process follows as our birds and our other mammals down here eat that passed away animal. So we have seen a lot of hawks and a lot of owls that have been severely affected by this. If we can get them in as soon as possible, you know, sometimes they have a good chance. We can do blood transfusions and fluids and all that great stuff. Um, but honestly, the, the best thing to do is to stop using rat poison because it poisons the rest of the environment. Down here, we also see a lot of glue trap use, which, you know, I understand. You don't like the bugs, you don't like the, the mice, the rats, anything like that. That is also a very painful death of starvation, unfortunately. And unfortunately, down here, we have a lot of small owls, a lot of screech owls that see that cricket wiggling on the glue, that see the worms wiggling on the glue and take it as an easy meal. So they fly down, they try to grab the insect or the little lizard that's been stuck there, and they in turn get stuck. Now, if we have owls that get stuck in a glue trap, um, it can damage their feathers, and those feathers may not grow back healthily for over six months. And that is a huge time to be in rehab if those feathers have not been damaged to the point of no return. So we do caution people. We ask not to use glue traps or rat poison, as it is not ethical to use around the wildlife that we have here. And if you do have questions about it, feel free to shoot us a message or, you know, say something in the comments section, and we can direct you to other means of um, extermination if you need it. All right, so a little bit about Mina. Just a couple of cute photos to start us off here. Um, so Mina is a very photogenic bird. She's also happiest when she's eating, as you can see here. Um, she's eating a little bit of chick, but as you can see, her tufts have completely disappeared. So tufts standing up over here, tufts completely standing down over here. So that is when she's happiest. Um, Mina is a great bird. She goes to schools with us. We go to golf clubs. We go to events all over the place, and she is a wonderful bird, but she started out with a very large attitude. So Mina came in from the wild. She did come in already missing a portion of her right wing. Now, naturally, um, it's against the law to amputate a bird's wing above a certain point. Hers was already amputated, and it was below that point, so she was deemed um, to have a good enough quality of life to try. So with Mina's big her big personality, um, that's really the reason that we decided to keep her. I mean, when she showed up at the clinic in her box, um, she launched out of that box, feet first, ran around the exam room wreaking havoc on everything. Um, and that was kind of our first sign that this bird has a will to live despite everything that's happened to it. 
And now she's proven us right. She's great for programs. She's great in her box. She likes coming home on the weekends and just hanging out. So she is a wonderful bird to have as part of our ambassador crew. Now here, um, so these are her x-rays. Now all of our animals get x-rays when they come into the clinic. All of our ambassador animals get yearly x-rays. They get uh, twice a year vet checks just to make sure everything looks good, blood work and everything. So, um, so this is Mina's healthy wing here. Where the red slash is, I don't know if you can see it very well, but right here is where her amputation site is on her bad wing. So this is an amazing comparison because birds and humans have the same arm bones. So we have all the same bones, they're just in different places. So as you can see, our fingers right here are at the distal portion of their wing here. Our radius and ulna are in the same spot, our humerus, the same spot. The only real difference is that birds have hollow bones. So that's a huge difference. That's why they don't weigh very much. Mina only weighs about three pounds. It's pretty small. When she's on the glove, it seems like, you know, 20, 30 pounds after a half hour or so. Uh, but the important thing here is that with those same bones, it kind of gives us, you know, a little bit more of an ability to connect with them here. So over here, this is her bad wing. You can see it with the circle. And the wing just kind of stops right there. So she came in with that already having healed over. It didn't heal well. There was a lot of infection. And it doesn't look like she has, you know, I guess she has a large portion of the wing if you look like this. But based on what she has, when you pull that wing out, there's just a couple inches. So it looks like she's got a ton until you see it up close. And then it really doesn't look like there's very much. And you can kind of tell why she has her balance issue. The other things to know about these guys is their primary feathers, all these feathers on the outside of the wing here, they, drew, they grow directly out of the bone. So anytime that bone has been affected, it can also affect feather growth as well, which can lead to some painful uh, feather issues as well. So um, this is a photo of when Mina came in. You can see hopefully how big and swollen that wing was. There was a lot of discharge inside. There were some feathers that had you know, gone really bad, that grew in the wrong way. There was dirt, debris, a whole bunch of infection. Um, they got cleaned up really nicely. So sorry, I didn't give you a squeamish warning. Um, it cleaned up really nicely. They closed it really nicely around the bones there. She had some feather growth um, that was coming in an inappropriate direction, so it was very uncomfortable. So she did go through a period of rehab where she got medications and antibiotics and, and all that great stuff just to make sure she could heal. And after that point, we did start training to make her an ambassador. So this was a few months later um, after she had been glove trained. She just has a little bit of a scab left here. And that's because every time she goes through molt, every time her new feathers grow in, it can be a little bit painful to her. So whenever she starts to feel pain uh, based on her feather growth, I'll walk into the enclosure and she'll just kind of stick it right in my face to show me that it hurts. So that's kind of the first sign. I do massage it every day to make sure that there is no additional swelling, it's not warm to the touch, and she's gotten very, very good about this. So I can pick her up, I can pull that wing out, I can check it every day and make sure it looks nice and healthy at all times. A little scab here and there is not a big deal, especially because as those feathers grow in, she will pluck them. So we have to keep a close eye on that. And if she does let me know that she's feeling painful, I will be sure to talk with our veterinarians and we'll put her on some anti-inflammatories uh, until that pain has passed or until those feathers have come out. So one thing I love about her is she's a foster parent. Um, not all birds get along. So we can't try her with certain babies. It, they don't always take. Um, this situation was wonderful a couple years ago. The baby started off in the nest box and Nina sat right there protecting it. We couldn't go in the cage. She was a wonderful foster parent for a couple days while this baby was waiting to get re-nested. Um, great horned owls are horrible nest builders. They are known for taking over nests of other large birds rather than building it themselves. They are known for depositing their eggs on open platforms with no edges. So um, this baby did roll right off a platform with no edges. So we just had to get somebody up 60 or so feet in the air um, with a bucket truck to make sure that we could put the baby safely back up there, but not on a platform with no edges. So here they are together. As you can see, um, two separate photos of them with baby in the nest box here. And then baby was successfully returned to the nesting site. The parents were up there trying to kill us the whole time. It was a very successful reuniting and baby did successfully fledge and learn how to fly and did fantastic that season. Um, the parents have since actually the following year they did reuse this fake nest box, which is pretty cool. Um, so no more babies falling off that platform. 
So Mina came in the same way everything else does, in a box with a generic label. A lot of them say birds, some of them say baby pelican, they're really a morning dove. Everybody wants their bird to be a bald eagle, they're usually not, but that's okay. We just appreciate that people are finding and helping these animals. So every animal that comes in gets triage, they get appropriate pain medication, they get appropriate fluids, they get x-rays. We also have an in-house lab so we can run blood work for everybody. Um, we have a wonderful surgical suite where we can do endoscopy, soft tissue surgery, shell repair surgeries, orthopedic surgeries. So we really try to individualize patient care for every single species, every single animal that comes through our door. We want it to be as quick and painless as possible, but you know, some of these things don't just miraculously fix themselves overnight. Um, so we're very lucky to have an incredible team that we work so closely with. And obviously our ultimate goal is release. Not every animal is capable of being released. Mina, for example. All of our wildlife ambassadors that we have here at Crow have some type of medical condition that prevents them from being released to the wild. They would not be successful. So in cases like that, we determine, well, first, can we keep them here at the clinic? And if not, if they are a placeable animal, we can send them all over the United States if we have to. And um, we recently sent a bald eagle to St. Louis. We recently sent a brown pelican out to the Fresno Zoo in California. And um, we also sent a white pelican down to the Florida Keys. So we are constantly working with other clinics to better the lives of all these animals that we have that can or can't make it. Um, but ultimately our goal is release. So we do what we can and we try our very best. Um, but we couldn't do it without all of you, hopefully there's a bunch of you watching. Without the support of donors, without the support of all of you coming to see our programs and everything, and um, this could not be possible. You know, you are providing the care that we need to give our animals by funding our operation here. So thank you very much. Um, so if you like what you see, like I said, feel free to donate. Um, if you don't want to directly donate on Facebook here, we have an amazing Amazon wish list that we are constantly updating for various things that we need. Um, you can also visit our online uh, merchandise store. Our store is officially online for all those t-shirts and cool souvenirs that you would obviously love to give other people as presents. Um, and if you like what you see, don't be afraid to rate us on TripAdvisor. Visit our Facebook page. We are constantly posting patient updates and various photos of our adorable ambassadors like Nina. Um, and others just to keep everybody in the loop and knowing what is good. So if you have questions, please feel free to put them in the comments. We'll get back to you as soon as possible. And thank you so much for joining us on this beautiful Wednesday afternoon.